brothers and sisters. It's good to see everybody this morning. Huh? Thank you to all our friends watching online. Glad to be able to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with everybody this morning. Let's pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you have made this day. We're excited to see what you're going to do. Holy Spirit, you are in charge. You have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, let's stand up and worship. We worship at home. Of God 
And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Lift that up again, all my life, come on And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good all my life you have been so, so good With every breath With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God of God. If the mountains are where you are Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys If you grace the other side Oh, how long have I chased rivers Lowly seas to where they rise Guess the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heartache, you need them more or less inclined. I would search. Stop at nothing You're just not that hard to find Oh, so I will praise you on the mountain And I will praise you when the mountain's in my way You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands, in the heartache all the same Oh Beneath your glory Does your kindness extend the path From where your feet rest on the sunrise To where you sweep the sinners past Oh, how fast would you come running just a shadow, shadow me through the light Trace my steps through all my failures and Cast me out the other side For who could dare ascend that mountain The valley hill called Calvary for the one I call good shepherd Like a lamb was slain for me Oh, so I will praise you on the mountain 
And I will praise you when that mountain's in my way. You're the summit where my feet are. And I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're, You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same song of ascent and whenever I walk through wherever I am your name can move mountains wherever I stand and if ever I walk through the valley of death you'll sing through the shadows my song of ascent oh my song of ascent Mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave. Oh, so I will praise you on that mountain. And I will praise you when the mountain's in my way. You're the summit where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is Islands in the heartache all the same. Yes, we thank you that we can enter your presence this morning, Lord, that we can that we can worship you, the God of the mountaintops and the God of the valleys. Yes. We turn our ears to you, Holy Spirit, to what you have for us this morning, Lord. We thank you that even though we may be suffering, Lord, we can still praise you. We can still call you out as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one who can move mountains. The one who can make a way where there is no way. The one who parts the seas. Yes, the one who breaks strongholds. The one who breaks walls. The one who breaks chains. Yes, you are a mighty God who does all that and more. There are no words to describe you, Father. I was drawn in your word to Psalm number 56, verse 8, where it says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. We thank you, Lord, that our suffering never is for waste. We thank you that you, have, you love us so much that you have recorded the tears of our suffering. They are written in your book that you want to meet us in our place of suffering. Father, if there's a, a, a brother or sister who is suffering this morning, 
please meet them in that place of suffering. I know you are there with us in that. Meet them with open arms, Lord. Yes. Mm. Yes. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the ultimate example of suffering. That you died the most unjust death in the history of the world and you did it for us so that we could be with you. So that you knew what our suffering was like. So that you could meet us in that place, Lord. Mm. Teach us in this place this morning, Father God. Yes. Yes. Lead us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake, Lord. Yes. Father, I pray that we remove any sense of distraction this morning. Any sense of that's going to take our minds and, and have them wander, Lord. That we would have our minds directly focused on your word this morning and what you have for us. That no notification would be greater than the word that you have for us this morning, Lord. Through your word. Yes, that we would not leave here the same as when we entered, that there would be transformation, that, mm, that we could take our suffering and give it to you, Lord, that we could even leave it right here at the altar, because in, in you, Jesus, the yoke is easy and the burden is light, amen, that we could leave it here this morning, that we could leave here lighter than when we came in, that, a weight, that you would lift the weight of suffering off our shoulders this morning, Father God, in your presence this morning. We thank you for this time, Lord. I pray... Mm, he would just flow through my brother Dave as he gives the message this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would flow through him, that you would direct every word that comes out of his mouth, that the flow would just be tremendous, that it would be like arrows just striking into our hearts this morning. Yes. Give us grace as we hear your word. Give us grace as we hear it to receive it, Lord. You are the King of kings. You are the master of excellency, Jesus. And we lift you up and exalt you this morning in your mighty name. We all say amen. Brothers and sisters, you may be seated. Kids may be dismissed to grow zone. And now our brother David Lemoyne is going to come up and give us a message from God's Word. Good morning. Oh, Steve is rounding up the little grow zoners this morning, heading on out. Hey, I want to I, I want to just express a uh, express a word of appreciation to our worship team. Now, I want to I want to thank Curtis for bringing the Soggy Bottom Boys Club uh, into service this morning. Amen. Uh, you know, I, I spent a little time in the South. You know, I lived in Alabama for ten years, and and I was sitting there watching the. Uh, Tennessee uh, football game yesterday, and then I come to church today, and it just kind of brings back some good memories, good friends, good barbecue, good music, uh, things like that. Um, this morning, I want to begin with uh, reading a, a passage of scripture, and then we'll jump into the message this morning. But uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, if you've spent any time, you know that I like interaction, so feel free to share your thoughts. Anything on your mind, if I ask a question, don't assume that it's rhetorical. Uh, feel free to interact. And I certainly want to welcome those that are uh, uh, participating, worshiping uh, Christ uh, virtually today with us. Certainly want to extend a welcome to them as well. So I'm going to begin as a springboard to this morning's message. I'm going to read out of James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And then we're going to jump into this week 4 on Rooted, where we're talking about evil talking about suffering. Where is God in the midst of evil? Where is God in the midst of suffering? So I'm going to begin with James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you can become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. We are very familiar with the questions of today. When we think about evil and we think about suffering, we ask ourselves, Christians and non-Christians alike, we ask ourselves, if God is a loving Father, why does He permit so much evil and suffering in the world today? If God is actually sovereign and He's in control 
Why do so many things seem to get out of hand? Why are so many things around us spinning out of control? And we ask, our, that, ask God these same questions when we're in the midst of our own trials, we're in the midst of our own sufferings, we're in the midst of our own uh, struggles, when we're experiencing suffering, or maybe somebody has meted out some evil directed toward us in terms of a relationship or what have you, we ask these same questions. If God is a loving Father, why is this happening to me? Amen. We are done. <laughs> Somebody showed up with the Cliff Notes version. Thank you. All right, we'll just close in prayer, take the offering. We'll move on and get to the restaurants. But think about it for a moment. This is probably the core issue that atheists, scoffers, and slanders have toward the Christian faith. They say, well, if evil exists, God cannot exist. As if God existing and evil is mutually exclusive. The uh, softer skeptic would say this, well, if evil exists, and we acknowledge that evil exists, God may exist, and here's the softer tone toward God, that he may be weak or incompetent or have the inability to actually respond to evil and suffering in our world. And when you boil down the argument, it really comes down to that, and we have to ask ourselves, is God weak? Is he incompetent? Is he distant? Is he working on things that are much more important than what's going on in our life and around our lives? We have to ask ourselves, where is God in the midst, where is God in the presence of evil and suffering in our own lives and the world abroad? It's a fair question. And I want to propose to you this morning that God is not distant, that God is not detached from evil and suffering in the world, but I want to propose to you that God is right there in the midst of the suffering and the evil that we see all about us in our nation and across the world today. I want to propose to you that God is loving, he's compassionate, he's caring, and he is right there in the midst of evil and suffering. We're going to fast forward, but if you remember at the cross, it says that Jesus embraced the cross, that he embraced the suffering. And I feel that if we spend a little bit of time thinking about this and why God permits suffering and evil, that maybe by the end of our time together today and thinking about our walk with God and his work in our lives and thinking about people around us, I want to propose to you that in the midst of the worst types of trials and tribulations and pain and suffering and loss, that there's an opportunity, a door of opportunity that God opens up to each and every one of us where we can actually embrace suffering. We can actually embrace evil. Not that we're going to commit evil, but we can acknowledge it. We can be honest as Christians, but we can embrace it because we know that there's some life lessons that God's word shares with us when it comes to evil and suffering in this world. I want to propose to you that one of the reasons, well, before we jump into this, we got to talk about evil and let's define evil. Okay. There's two types of evil. There's natural or there's human evil. And that's just simply stated as one human commits an evil action toward another. We know that that is just obvious and conspicuous in today's world. Evil is just running, running rapid. People have, uh, are willing to say and do just about anything today to another human being. When we think about what I perceive to be some of the most heinous forms of evil would be sex trafficking and pedophilia. And that's just right there. But there's all types of evil that just runs rampant throughout our country. I think about an act of evil that took place in our uh, state uh, uh, just a couple of years ago. There was a young man with an automatic weapon, entered on an elementary school ground, intentionally went into the office, went room from room from room, and massacred both adults and children. We're well aware of that. It's called Newtown, Connecticut. It's human evil. We can't even begin to understand. We can't even begin to define. We can't even begin to wrap our heads around an individual that would pick up a weapon and go in methodically and intentionally take the lives of little innocent children and the teachers and the administrators. Can't even begin to understand that. As horrific as that is, as horrific as that is, it's human evil. It didn't come from God. It came from man. And it really points us in the direction that we really can't understand how deep 
the darkness and depravity is within a human soul. We know that over time, circumstances, situations, conditioning, life experiences, we know that evil all throughout history has manifested itself through individuals and they have wreaked havoc on people around them. And just because human evil exists doesn't mean that God does not exist. It doesn't mean that God is weak. It doesn't mean that God is detached, that he's distracted. Then we think about natural evil. And if you're in the insurance business on the small print at the bottom of the contract, it says what? Act of God, right? If we can't explain something in life, we can't define it, we just write acts of God. What are some of those acts of God that we find uh, in an insurance policy or we just, what just simply comes to mind when I say acts of God? Hurricane, earthquake, typhoon, tornado, fallen trees. Somebody say fallen trees. Okay. That's a new one for me. Others? Floods, lightning, pandemics. We all ascribe these, we attribute this to acts of God. And I want to propose to you that not only does human evil exist, but natural evil exists, and neither uh, are an argument against the very existence of God. They all go hand in hand. I've got a co-preacher this morning. They all go hand in hand. She's absolutely right when you think about that. Natural evil, they go hand in hand. The Bible shows us, the Bible illustrates why natural evil exists today. And we just go back to Adam and Eve. And we just go back to the book of Genesis. And we remember, and I touched on this last week or the week before, where God created a pristine, pure world. He created an, a, a, a place of joy, a place of love, a choice of mutual respect, a place of bonding, a place of intimacy. And it wasn't God that broke that relationship down. It was Adam and Eve. The temptation was just simply too great. They couldn't stay away from it. They entered into a conversation with evil. He planted thoughts and ideas into their mind. They mixed up the word of God. They embraced a counterfeit the counterfeit uh, word of God, and they took advantage of the apple, the tree of knowledge of, uh, of good and evil. And we know from that point forward that the world fell. Adam and Eve fell. He shoved them out of the garden. They turned around. There was a wall of fire. He put a do not enter. He wrapped around that evidence tape that a con crime had been committed. And he says, you got to go about your life the hard way because you rejected me and you were naked and I came to talk to you and speak to you and you knew that you had committed evil, you had sinned against me and you were hiding and you were in a cave and you were covering yourselves up because you were afraid and you no longer wanted to have intimacy with me. But part of that fall was the pandemics, the floods, the tsunamis, big word for me. Can you, can you say tsunami for me? Tsunami. This is my, this is my uh, front row dictionary and thesaurus. Did I say thesaurus correctly? Possibly. Okay. Right. Thank you. But the point is, is both exist and both are not attributed to God. Both are actually attributed to humankind. And just because there's human evil and natural evil in the world is not a viable argument against the existence of God. And I want to propose to you this morning that there's some life lessons or there's some principles that we can take away when we think about evil and suffering in our own lives. And when we turn on the TV or fire up the computer and we see the enormous amount of evil all around us, I want to propose to you that there's some principles or life lessons that we can take away that can have a radical impact, a radical effect that can change our idea about evil. It can change our perception about suffering to the point that we may be filled with a little more love, a little more passion, a little more compassion, and a little more mercy and a little more grace when we look at our fellow man in the midst of evil and suffering. So what I want to propose to you, and I'm going to come out of the box pretty hard this morning. I thought about not sharing this point, but I think it's a valid point. It's not shared that often. It's a principle that is true. We don't hear about it that often. Uh, certainly, you're not going to hear about this on the media. And I want to share this principle with you because I think it's a good reminder when we think about evil and we think about a perspective 
toward evil, and we think about God's relationship with evil, I want to propose to you that God uses evil in this world to judge mankind. God uses evil and suffering in this world as a form of judgment. I know you're scratching your head. You haven't heard that in quite some time. This is just a little old school here. When we start talking about sin, we talk about God's wrath. We talk about uh, God being angry. We talk about God using tools and people to, uh, uh, to uh, exercise judgment upon others in the world. But I want to propose to you that the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Yeah, there's a different relationship there, and there's a different mission, the big picture. Underlying is always the mission that God would work and redeem people and bring people unto themselves, and that they would discover paradise lost, that perfect relationship with God through Jesus Christ. What I want to propose to you that as long as we're in this world, that God can very well use suffering and evil as a tool to place judgment on humanity across the board. And when we go back to the book of Genesis, we think about Noah. We're very familiar with Noah. We've grown up in the Sunday school. We know the story. Maybe we know the story too well. But Noah was a different man. Let me read to you out of Genesis this description of the world in which Noah lived in and this uh, uh, resume, if you will, on Noah. And we find this in Genesis chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. God saw that human evil was out of control. You ever think when you look around that this is just getting out of control? There is just no light at the end of the tunnel. There is no hope for any type of reconciliation, restoration of civility, mutual respect. This is Noah's age. We're not talking about 2020 here in the United States. We're talking about Noah's age. Listen to this. People thought evil. They meditated on evil. Not only did they think about evil, they imagined the evil. They were conjuring up new ways to manifest this evil, to participate in evil. They were imagining, how can I possibly take this seed of evil and pour the water and the fertilizer on it and let it grow and pull the weeds that this evil thought, this imagination would come into fruition. Why? Because mankind from the, since the beginning has always wanted to satisfy themselves. There's an innate desire to satisfy me. I want to live my life apart from God. I want to call the shots. I want to be the big man. I want to be number one. And there's something within each and every one of us, Christian and non-Christian alike, there's something within each and every, every one of us that when we wake up, we want to live life on our own terms. We want to call the shots. We don't want any outside intrusion. You know, if you're married, you understand that. The first time your wife comes up to you and disagrees or you, know, you talk about something in a, a, a period of silence, not a good silence. Maybe it's a, a, a night in the bed laying next to her and you can't sleep. Maybe you have that type of conversation. You know full well that we don't like that outside intrusion, even if it's somebody that loves us, somebody that cares for us. They pull us aside and say, listen, honey, I want you to think about this. I immediately bristle. I stiffen up. And I know that many of us do that with our spouses, but think about that. When God comes into our world and he starts talking about evil and he talks about suffering and he talks about the depravity of human souls and he talks about sin, humanity bristles up. They stiffen up and they're not open and they're not receptive to God's word or God's perspective when it comes to evil and when it comes to suffering. Continuing on, think about this. This broke his heart. Can anybody else uh, uh, name a time in Scripture where God says, this broke my heart? Is there any other place in Scripture where God says, my heart is just absolutely broken over what I see? It goes on. Listen to this. God's heart is so broken. I'll get rid of my ruined creation. I'll make a clean sweep people animals snakes bugs birds the works i'm sorry 
I made them. It's always a but. Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. Think about that for a moment. Think about being Noah in that environment. God liked what he saw in Noah. What the Bible is saying is Noah was a man that was on the same page as God. That even though evil and suffering was pervasive around Noah, Noah walked with God. Noah inquired of God. Noah brought God into his life and the decisions and the plans and the purposes that he had dreamed up or thought about his future. He was walking in lockstep with God. That's an amazing testimony when you think about that Noah was on the face of the earth and God was having one conversation with one human being. I don't know what the population was in Noah's day, but I know that it was beyond Noah's family. Can you imagine living in a world that's so pervasive with evil that God is just speaking to one individual because he's walking with God and bringing God into his life and the decisions that face him? That is absolutely astounding to me. And think about this. God told Moses, not God told Noah, I, want, I, I, am, I am going to destroy the world. That's the message that that God gives to one man in an evil society. I'm going to destroy the world, but don't tell them. I want you to go out and I want you to make an ark because it's going to rain. Noah scratches his head. I don't even know what this thing is called rain. All I know is that brooks are bubbling up and it flourishes the uh, surface of the earth. But I've never seen this thing that God is referring to called rain. I have no concept of what rain is. And so God says to one man on the face of the earth that I want you to build an ark. I want you to build a boat. Noah doesn't even know what a boat is. He doesn't even know what the purpose of a boat is. But God tells Noah, to build a boat in the desert a hundred miles away from the nearest body of water that that boat could float in. A hundred miles away. And not only that, God gives Noah a project that lasted 120 years. This is Noah, the only man God's speaking to in a horrible, evil society. And God says, build a boat, take 120 years to build it, build it a hundred miles from the water, and the rain's going to come. And day in and day out, Noah got up and he walked with God and he went about his work after year after year after year after year after decades after decades after decades in an evil society and 120 years measured up and the ark and the boat was finished one man walking with God listening to God obeying God in all of humanity And he was faithful and he was obedient, even though he didn't understand what God was saying to him. And he didn't understand the purpose of the boat to begin with. But we know that the rain came and the waters began to rise. And it was fear, there was loss, there was pain there was dying. Can you imagine for a moment, put yourself back into Noah's shoes. You spent 120 years building this. And you have two ministries in life. You're working by day, building this ark for 120 years. And by nighttime after dinner, you're going out and you're witnessing. God gave Noah a three-word sermon. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Everywhere Noah went, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. i got to build my boat. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Three-word sermon. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Can you imagine if a pastor got up and preached for 120 years a three-word sermon that says, it's going to rain? We'd lock them up. We'd put them in a straight jacket. We'd put them on some Valium. We'd tuck them away in the crazy bin, right? He'd be in the, the, the one that flew, flew over to Cuckoo's Nest, right? It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. 120 years. Because God was going to judge humanity for the evil. That's absolutely amazing when you think about that there is a payday someday. I know what you're thinking, and I believe it too, that God is an unconditional lover of humanity. God is slow, very slow, long-suffering to anger that not one would perish. 
that God is so gracious and kind. We can't get away from this idea that God is love because the Bible says that God is love. And when we drown, drive down the streets of our neighborhood, the political posts remind us that if we're not convinced that God is love, that at the very least, we should love one another, that we should be loving, that we should be kind. We can't get away from this whole idea of love. But I want to propose to you that the message of the gospel has been sanitized. I want to propose to you that we're not getting the full story. I want to propose to you that there's an other side of God, that there's the other personality, there's the other perspective. I want to propose to you that, yes, God is love, but God is holy. Holy, 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 holy. And if God is holy, is he going to really compromise on this sin issue? Is God really going to kind of wink, wink, I'm holy, and then turn away from humanity? And let them press on. Are there really many ways to heaven? We can all walk blindly on our path, but we're going to all meet up on the sweet by and by. I want to propose to you that that's not the case. God's holy. There's a day rapidly approaching. There's a, what, what one pastor said, there's payday someday. There's a day where all of humanity is going to have to line up before a high and holy God and give account for every word. I'm in trouble because if you follow me on Facebook, you know that I'm a little looser on Facebook than I am in the church. But every word, every deed, every action... Every inaction, those things God asks us to do, but we're too busy and we say no or we delay or we get distracted with something that we think is better. There's a day where all of humanity is going to line up and be before a high and holy God. And there's payday someday. That's the other part of the message. God is loving. God is kind. God will do just about anything, including the, 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 the sending and the loss of the Son on the cross. He will move every obstacle. He will, he will bring down every barrier. He will lower every hoop, every jump, every obstacle between humanity and a holy God. He's done it through Jesus Christ. But I want you to think about what this passage says here. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 through 17. I watched while he ripped off the sixth seal. A bone-jarring earthquake. Sun turned black as ink. Moon all bloody. Stars falling out of the sky like figs shaken from a tree. In a high wind, sky snapped shut like a book. Islands and mountains sliding this way and that, and then pandemonium. Pandemonium is not a roller coaster at Six Flags. Sounds like it would be, but we're talking about scripture, and it was absolute pandemonium. Everyone and his dog, in my case would be two, running for cover. Listen to this. Kings, Princes, generals, rich and strong, along with every commoner, slave or free, they hid, just like Adam and Eve, they hid in the mountain caves, in the rocky dens, calling out the mountains and the rocks, refuge, hide us from the one seated on the throne, and the wrath of the Lamb, the great day of their wrath has come, who can stand it? Who? can stand it. The gospel's been sanitized. I'm in sales. I know how it works. I know the questions they're going to ask. I know the objections. I know the excuses. 
I know the delays. And we account for that and we practice and we go over it so that if anybody raises the objection, they raise the balk or they want to pause, we know how to respond to that. I want to tell you that Christianity has sanitized the gospel. We have turned our backs to evil. We've turned our backs to suffering. And we've walked away and we've let suffering and evil run its course. And it is rampant in our age just the same way that it ran rapid in Noah's age. It exists. And there's a payday someday. We got to think about that. We got to be prepared for that. When I think about my relationships, listen, I don't want to love people on their way to hell. I know that you might come out of a background or you might come out of faith out of a out of faith where where hell has become a figment of our imagination. That it doesn't exist. It's just something that's scary. It's something that, uh, a tool, it's a way that religion manipulates people to get in line with the religious teachings and the doctrines of the day. But I'm here to tell you that, listen, hell is very real. And if you don't believe me, crack open the Bible. God teaches or speaks about hell and money more than any other topics in Scripture, including love. I don't want to love people in the hell. If that's what it means, I don't want any part of it. I don't want to be standing next to somebody on payday someday, and they turn to me and they say, why in the hell did you not talk to me about hell? Didn't you love me enough to talk about a holy God? A God that will judge. A God that will condemn. But at the same time, not only do I not want to love people to hell, I certainly don't want to insult them to get them into heaven. All right? We struggle with grace and truth. So as Christians... Living in a post-Christian society, meaning that our values and our morals are no longer held up as the plumb line, that we live in an age of relativism, that is what is right for Marvin may or may not be right for me, and Marvin can go about Marvin's business, and who am I to interrupt Marvin's joy and happiness to talk about a God that's loving and a God that's holy. Amen. Yeah. I want to propose to you that when we look at evil and suffering in this world, TJ, God's looking for Noah's. God's looking for men and women that will work by day and witness the other hours of the day. God is looking for people that he can speak to, that he can commune with, that he can give them a message of hope and promise, but it's also a message that's balanced with accountability and responsibility and ultimately judgment if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And that's the message we have to first live, and it's secondly, it's a me message, message that we need to share with others. I want to propose to you, not only does God use suffering to judge the world, you guys are kind of staring at me because I came out of the box pretty hard, right? Some of you are scratching your head and you're wondering, why. well, you know, I haven't heard something like that in a long time. I, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to go back and, and uh, uh, check the scripture. I'm going to encourage you to go back and read the scripture because God is unchanging. He's unyielding. Yes, he's gracious and he's loving. And we had this season before us where we need to share the unconditional love and acceptance and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. We have to share that, but in the back of our minds, we have to understand that we want to love them into heaven. And we also want to share the truth about God's word to get them there. But I want to propose to you another principle that we can take away when it comes to suffering and evil is that God uses suffering to set us up for success. Here's the good news. God sets us up for success. 
2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you knew it, He, before you know it, He brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Who's lived that verse? Suffering, evil knocks at the door. You're fooled. You open it up. You let them in. Wreaks havoc. Turns your household upside down. Turns your finances upside down. Turns your uh, 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 physical health upside down. Turns relationships with people upside down. You let him in. He comes in and it's like a hurricane in a trailer park. Just going to turn everything upside down and complete disarray and destruction. And we've been there. I've been there. I've stood there. And I've looked at the damage in my life. I've looked at the fallout of poor decisions, the things that I brought into my own life. I look at the consequences, and I think to myself, why, God, why did you not interrupt? Why did you not stop this? Why did you let me be so arrogant? Why did you let me be so proud? Why did you leave me on a long leash and let me make poor decision after poor decision after poor decision just to stand in the center of the wreckage of 15 years of my life? Why, God? And I want to propose to you that it's a setup for success. Yeah, it's a setup for worldly success. There are some life lessons that we can only learn by going through suffering and wrestling with evil when God's by our side. You know, I asked Steve Timmons to uh, share a post that he made on Facebook this week, about two days ago. Let me bring it up here. Uh, let me type in Steve Timmons. I asked him to share it, but he's with our Grow Zoners. So he came over and he asked me just to take the liberty to read this. But I want to talk about God using suffering, God using pain to set us up for something better, to set us up for success. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes walking with God is two step, one step forward and two steps back. There's sometimes I feel like I'm a hamster on that wheel and I am working my tail off and I am going round and I can hear it. I had hamsters when I was a kid. I didn't like hamsters. We also had a Siamese cat that took care of the hamster. That was another story. But I laid in bed at night, and I could hear that, that whining wheel of that hamster, and I think, that thing's crazy. It's nighttime. I'm trying to sleep. Go to bed. Get on the right schedule. Play during the day. Sleep at night. What's wrong with this animal? And we feel like that, and I feel like that, don't you? I wake up in the morning. I come down the stairs and all the kids are up and the wife's up and breakfast is going and I, and, and I start hearing a conversation and you know how it is. We, you know, we don't know. We, you know, we, we're, we're by and large, you know, 99.9% of the time, we're a perfect family, much like yours. <laughs> you know. but, but there is that small point oh 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 one where one of us saints slip up, <laughs> right? You know it. And it's like, God, can't, can't, like a hamster, can't you just pick me up and put me in a different cardboard box in this? Can you temporarily put me in a, a cardboard box? Let me, let me escape away. But you get the story. It's tough. What I want to propose to you, I'm going to share Steve Timmons' uh, posting here on Facebook. Listen, if you're not friends with Steve on Facebook, you need to. First of all, he has some really corny jokes. He's a great guy, right? I think Steve is probably the only one in our congregation that has the, uh, the courage and the confidence to be corny around other people, right? That, that's what's really attractive about Steve. Is he, what, Steve is, Steve, Steve's the kind of guy is what you see is what you get. And I like that. That's refreshing in today's day and age. What you see is what you get. And I want to share this post with you. It kind of touches my heart because I was in a similar situation. I remembered in 2013 when I lost my job at Mass Mutual Retirement Plans Division, which ultimately was going to move into the Enfield office. 
Some of you who were close to me then remember this very well, I'm sure. Quite honestly, it was one of the most discouraging days of my life. It was an instance where I went in fully, I went in fully expecting God to come in big and provide, helping me pass a Series 6 exam so that I could keep my job and move up in my department. If you're in finance, you know the Series 6 and a Series 7 is extremely difficult. Okay? I took the series, listen, I took the series seven three times to pass it. It's pretty difficult. Steve takes the series six, right? Listen to this. So I could keep my job and move up in my department. Then I wound up failing it by four points. Okay? And clean, then I would then I wound up failing it by four points, and I cleaned my desk out the following Monday. My tears were shed, especially by me. Many tears were shed, especially by me. However, if I wound up passing the exam and staying there, I would now be one of those people who would have been laid off in the middle of the pandemic and just in time for Christmas. God, this is his heart. God, please help them. This is a guy that missed a mark by four points, lost his job, praying for people that were successful, are now facing layoff in the midst of pandemic. Okay. At that time in 2013, I was hurting immensely. But looking back and reading this news today, I see God's provision. Now I have a job that is much better, both physically and spiritually, with a solid company, regar- irregardless, though, God provides Maybe not in the ways that we want, but always in the ways we need. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Give them a clap. Thank you, Steve. God uses suffering as a setup for success. Maybe not success in the way that the world defines success. But on that day, it was a setup for Steve's future and his family. We don't always understand suffering. We don't always understand failure. We don't always understand loss. But what we do know is that God is always with us. He's next to us. He's going to hold our hand. He's going to clench our hearts. And he's going to walk us through any valley, any loss, any suffering, any type of failure. God is always there. Now, I want to set up a, a, a video that, I, that I've asked uh, to be shared this morning. And this is a video by a college buddy of mine by the name of Jeff Martin. The reason I'm going to share this this video, we're going to just watch about two minutes of it, is Jeff is a good college buddy of mine. In fact, he was the... uh, he was the leader of uh, uh, a men's college student group my first year, and uh, this was not my first four years. Uh, I don't want to be misleading here. I partied out, dropped out, and flunked out of three different colleges. I'm talking about later on in life when I got my life together, and Christ found me, and I went back to school, and one of the first people that I met was Jeff Martin. Now, Jeff Martin, you're laughing about that, right? And Jeff Martin... God bless him. His wife, Lisa, has been in a medically induced coma for three weeks due to COVID-19. Okay? It hit him pretty hard. Uh, he rebounded, hit his brother. His brother went to the hospital in ICU and rebounded. But his wife is laying in a hospital in Georgia with a feeding tube and with a ventilator. And she's been in that situation for about three weeks. I've shared this with several of my friends in the men's group. And I want to encourage you to pray for Jeff and Lisa Martin because he's posted some posts. And although he's excited about God's opportunity, he's excited about the possibility that God's going to move in Lisa's life and heal her. There There's a real sense of despair and uh, not a loss of hope, but a sense that this could go in a direction that I don't want to go in. And I asked him, I said, Jeff, could you share uh, uh, your testimony about what God is doing in your life in the midst of suffering? So this is Jeff Martin. Uh, You can find this on Facebook uh, titled Simple Truth. Let's go ahead and share this video. It. So the purpose of this of this struggle, even though we don't invite it, even though no one would want to go through what what Lisa and, and our family are going through right now, nobody would ask for this kind of thing. Yet 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 
in that, in that, there's a ministry being born. There's a ministry being born because God is a God of mercy and God is a God of comfort. And God is the one who takes the hurt and he takes the pain and he, and somehow the thing that was meant for our harm becomes good because he's able to take that and, 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 Another, that's another text out of Romans 8. Uh, what was meant to harm us actually becomes good because ministry occurs. So I can say this. I don't know um, the future and what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. I do. And I trust who holds my future and Lisa's future and all of our futures. I trust that somehow in some way he's bringing about glory in all of these things. And so I'm trusting with my whole heart that uh, that the best things are still to come. That the best things that God has in store for us are still to come. I am pr praying. I am I'm proclaiming. I'm desiring. I've let my desire be made known to God that I want Lisa to be fully restored. I pray for that restoration. I pray for her healing. I pray to have my wife back. And and I and I will I will not quit praying that. And I will trust in some way God will always heal forever. He'll always heal, and I trust that, and I trust him because by his stripes we are healed, and even in the affliction that we're going through right now, that struggle is producing for us a ministry, and I can tell you right now, the prayers that have been lifted up around the world for my wife, for our family in this moment, I am not blowing smoke. I'm telling you straight up, those have actually buoyed us. They've given us great strength. They have strengthened our hope. They have strengthened our desire. They have given us some encouragement to know the body of Christ, the kingdom of God is connected. So the purpose of this, of this, what's he saying to us? What's the message? What's the life, life message that Jeff is sharing with us this morning? Hope? Why do we have hope? Yeah, we believe in our Creator. What's another takeaway from the video? Okay. Happened for a reason. Coming out stronger than this. Absolutely true. Any other? What's, what, what's the message that God's sharing through Jeff to, to you? No matter what happens, you can always trust that God's at work. Let me read that passage of Scripture again. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, He brings us alongside someone else. I like pearls. I like the imagery. I like the illustration of a pearl, and if you know how pearls are made, you know, whether it's an oyster or a clam, that some type of irritant like a grain of sand, but usually it's a parasite gets into the soft, sensitive, uh, mushy side of the clam, and it irritates that clam or that oyster, and it begins to secrete a fluid that creates a layer around that parasite. And because it's still sharp and it's still an irritant, it continues to secrete this fluid over and over and over again. And layer after layer after layer, what happens is that parasite has now become something very beautiful and precious in our sight. I'm reminded of the passage of Scripture where Paul had the thorn in his side, and we don't know what that thorn is. Many people have speculated what that, form, what that thorn would be. But what I take away from that is when Paul says, I pleaded and I pleaded and I pleaded and I pleaded with God to remove this thorn from my side. And what did God say to Paul? My grace is sufficient for you because my power is perfected in your weakness. I got good news for you this morning. I had a four-point sermon, and we stopped at two. Suffering and evil is real. Suffering and evil is real. 
And it is wreaking havoc in people's lives and in our lives. I want to share with you what the uh, passage of the Bible says is, if your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. I remember one of my favorite games uh, growing up in elementary school. You know, uh, speaking about the gospel being sanitized, education has been sanitized. What are, listen, I want to go back and I want to find the person that said, hey, you can no longer play dodgeball. Dodgeball was one of my favorite games because, see, I was a quiet kid in the back of the room. Dodgeball for me meant revenge. <laughs> this guy that bullied me, this guy that pushed me around, this guy that was a jerk, dodgeball was a unique opportunity for me to hold my ball until he was distracted and looked somewhere else, and I was hoping to tattoo the side of his face. Hey, the world's waiting for you to be distracted. It's waiting for you to turn another way. Because suffering is real. Evil is real. And quite honestly, we probably have all been tattooed with the dodgeball in life. None of us are immune. None of us are insulated against suffering and evil. The question is, is what do we do with it? How do we respond? I'm so grateful and thankful that we don't have a God that is so distant, so unfeeling, so unreal, so non-living, so detached from his creation and the people that he's made. I am so glad that we have a God that is alive. And I am so grateful that there was a man called Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, every bit man if he were just man, understands every thought, every feeling, every loss, every pain, Every twinge, every jab that this life, every jab at the throne of this world and your side, Jesus absolutely understands it. Even much better than we do. And when God the Father saw evil and he saw suffering, he didn't sit on his hands and do nothing. He said, Who's up for the task? Who's up for the job? Who's willing to suffer so that they can come alongside others and help them in their own suffering? And that was Jesus Christ. Yeah, he was high and he was holy and he was lifted up. But he took the robe off in heaven. And he zipped up skin. And he dwelt among us he suffered every form of evil this world had to offer through at him. And he suffered. He was rejected. He was persecuted. He was spit upon. He was beaten beyond recognition. They nailed him to a criminal's cross, although he was innocent. And they laughed and they joked and they gambled over the few precious belongings that he had and they watched him draw his last breath. And he said to Telestai, it's finished. I've conquered human evil and I've conquered natural evil. The curtain at temple was ripped. The door was open. The message was sent forth. And it's the same message that we have today. Listen, life 
is delusional and life is depressing apart from Jesus Christ. Suffering without Jesus means I am depressed, I'm full of no hope, there is despair, and I find myself questioning a good God and whether he even exists at all. But the Bible tells us that it's a good God, that he's a good God, he's a kind God, and that Jesus took all of this evil upon himself. And he died, and he was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. He conquered death, hell, the grave, and every form of suffering, and every form of evil in this world and in hell. And this is where Jesus is in the midst of suffering. He's right there. And he's saying, I know your pain. I know your loss. I know your doubts. I know your despair. I know your hopelessness. I know your failures. I know, in fact, failure after failure after failure after failure. I know it all. And this is what he's saying to us. Come to me. Come to me. All who are weary, all who are worn out, all of you that are laying flat on your back from the dodgeball game of life and your sucking wind, come to me and I'll give you rest. Father, we want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for your word. Lord, even as Christians, we turn on the news or we listen to the radio or we watch stuff on TV or we have a conversation with a friend over a cup of coffee. And God, it just seems like so many of the discussions, so much of the conversation is about evil and suffering and incivility and hatred and war and a polite or maybe not a polite exchange of ideas. God, we just know that there's so much division, so much pain, so much suffering, so much loss, so much evil. Sometimes, God, we feel like Noah. The world calls evil good. The world calls good evil. So, Father, we want to First and foremost, we want to embrace you. We're tired, we're wearied, we want rest. And we're inviting you to be a part of our lives, that we could rest with you, that we could spend time with you, that you could restore, reconstruct, that you could remedy the things that we're facing, the challenges, God. Father, we ask for those that are suffering that you would be present, that they would sense an overwhelming sense of your presence and your love and your grace, your strength to get through anything and everything that they are wrestling with today. God, we ask for that freedom. We ask for that deliverance. We ask for that place of hope. And Father, if there's just one of us here this morning that is still contemplating the existence of God, How can a good God exist in an evil world? Father, speak to their heart. Lord, remove the scales of their eyes. Touch and soften their heart. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to minister to that individual. They would know the truth. And that truth would set them free. We pray these things in Jesus' name.